after the hour, so we're going to start. We're going to begin today with a little bit of instru instruction. So, welcome to today's Society for Integrative Oncology Members Only webinar. My name is Holly, and I'm here behind the scenes to manage your webinar and to provide you an overview of a few of our GoToWebinar features. Your GoToWebinar control panel is on the right side of your screen. By clicking the orange arrow on the Grab tab, you can open and close the panel. To move the control panel, click and hold your left mouse button and drag. If you're looking to view the presentation in full screen, simply click the blue icon in the Grab tab. The audio pane includes all audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. Click Audio Setup to select your computer speaker or headset devices. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting Use Telephone, and the dial-in information will be displayed, including your audio pin. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions. We will not be taking audio questions this evening, so please do not use the hand raise tool. We will be taking questions by, by a type, so please type your questions into the question pane, and I will share them with Dr. Plotnikoff as time allows. At three points during this evening's presentation, you will be invited to participate in a quick poll. The poll will appear on your screen when launched. To participate, simply use your mouse or pointing device to click on your answer on the screen. We'll provide about one minute for each poll, after which we'll briefly display and report the live results. Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff is a board-certified internist and pediatrician who serves as an integrative medicine physician at the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing. He is the author of 22 textbook chapters and more than 50 first authored articles in the medical literature on topics related to interventional nutrition, herbal medicine, and spirituality in clinical care. Dr. Plotnikoff is the recipient of several international awards for research and teaching, as well as the Early Career Distinguished Achievement Award from the University of Minnesota Medical School. He serves as an editor of the new journal Global Advances in Health and Medicine and is co-author of the book Trust Your Gut, published by Canary in 2013. It is my pleasure to turn the presentation over to to your today's presenter, Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff. Dr. Plotnikoff, you should have the screen. Wonderful. Thank you, Holly. Oops, wait a second. Here we go. Okay. All right. I hope everyone can see this. I'm. Thank you for uh, coming, and I'm looking forward to actually um, sharing with you some insights which may, in fact, be quite helpful and certainly represent something new. Um, uh, in our approach to oncology. Now, I'm speaking as an internist, as a pediatrician, not as an oncologist, not as a microbiologist, um, but some kind of mixture of all of the above. And really following on what um, Francis Collins spoke about when, at the SIO meeting in 2011. And you may recall it, he said, wow, you know, you know I'm really excited about the, human, about the genome and that's been my life's work, but I think the future is the microbiome. And lo and behold, um, we are learning a great deal, and you've probably seen maybe on the cover of Science, Nature, Cell, Scientific American, uh, Time, Life, Newsweek, everything now is, seems to be microbiome oriented. That's really because we have, we're like pioneers in a, um, at the Kansas border in our covered wagons and someone is snipping the ribbon and we are like racing into this new territory um, 
really for the first time understanding the normal microbial makeup of the human body. And so with that, I'd like to ask actually the first question, and that is I just quick poll for uh, a couple dozen of us who are online right now. Are you currently prescribing probiotics for any of your patients? One moment, I'm having just a little bit of difficulty. Okay. There we go. Our poll should now be open. All right. Please go ahead and choose your answers. I have about 64% okay. in now, 71. Okay, almost everyone's in. Okay. Okay. Oh, people are still voting. And I have, I'm going to close the poll so, and okay. share our results. And our and results are 58% said yes, 42% said no. Okay. All right. Well, very cool. Uh, so now let me follow up with it. How many of us are personally taking probiotics at this time? And Holly, how are we doing percent-wise? I'm, again, having just a little bit of uh, a difficulty launching it. Hang on for one uh -oh. moment, please, okay. doctor. There we go. This does not usually happen to us. Okay. Well, we're only okay. doing three, so it'll be. All oh. right. One more. Here we go. Launching. There we go. Okay. So launching. Quick question. How many of us are personally using probiotics on a regular basis? And how are, how are we doing? I have 86% have voted, 93% have voted. Okay. Sounds good. All, right. All right, let's take a look at it. And here's our results. 77% said they do take probiotics, and 23% said no. Okay. All right, well, it's of interest to, to all of us, and uh, we'll move on now. Um, let's see, show my screen here, okay. Let's move on. Um, okay, so what is it that has been going on since 2005 with the start of the Human Microbiome Projects, the NIH? We can say that as of two, June of 2012, we really have a good understanding of normal human microbial variation. And um, so this is the foundation for moving forward really understanding what is the relationship to health and illness. In fact, um, we now have the chance to understand really how any changes in micro, microbiome are associated with or even cause illnesses. And likewise, we have a good understanding of how interventions may in fact prevent or treat illnesses. So, this all started really with the questions of what is the identity of the micro, our microbiome? What are they doing? You know, how is, how is the host responding? What are the unique characteristics of each individual? Um, why don't they kill us? And how do we maintain harmony? And so that there really is a residential microbiota, that is there are specific locations on the body that are persistent, and we can say microbes are conserved within the species and are also host-specific. But what we've learned also is the amazing fact is that the human body is about one trillion cells. The microbiome is somewhere between 10 and 100 trillion cells. So we're clearly outnumbered. 
And uh, most of these bacteria are in our intestines, predominantly the large intestine. And we're using anywhere, approximately about four pounds of bacteria. And it changes about 40% every day. Now, with this kind of being hugely outnumbered, the human genome, we know, is about 22,000 protein coding genes. But the microbiome of these 500 to 1,000 different species have approximately 8 million unique protein coding genes. So the key point is, actually, we're, we harbor about 360 times more bacterial genes than human genes. And actually, and there's 8 million and counting. Um, and they, these definitely have interactions with host and with host genes. Now, a lot of the studies, um, our understanding, have come in the past from using culture, both in kind of aerobic and anaerobic cultures. And Dr. Plotnikoff, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wondered if you are having difficulty with your slides. I can see my slides. Can no one else see my slides? Laura, are you seeing clearly? There we go. Now we're seeing them, Dr. Plotnikoff. I apologize. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Well, let me just back up. Um, now I... So, there we go. I wanted to okay, be Okay, so this is just a keep... Did people see these or not, Holly? Dr. Kapotnikoff, on my screen we had a question mark up until the point, uh, up until the point where I interrupted. Oh, okay. All right, so I've just um, put, a, put out here that actually here's just a general picture of the microbiome map just showing that actually there's great variability in the microbiome by location and by kind of the environment to location. Um, the key thing about you know, 360 times more bacterial genes than human genes. And we're at this point now of looking at, well, part of our understanding now has come from this use of a prokaryotic 16S uh, recombinant RNA gene for uh, ribosomal RNA gene um, for analyzing what is actually going on um, in terms of bacterial. Um, this is a mix of conserved regions for helix formation and nine highly variable regions present. Now, I'm wondering if you can see the, my arrow here. You can just kind of count across the peaks where you have kind of a huge uh, uh, variation. And it's a combination of conserved regions and this variability that allows us to understand the great uh, variation that exists. Now, what has been going on have been two processes. Um, here, kind of here we've got all their microbiota. Following the left-hand um, chart, you know, we've got this kind of um, metagenomic sequencing using the 16S uh, ribosoma RNA gene, using amplification sequencing of this heterogeneous mixture and a bioinformatics analysis that gives us an understanding of alignment, classification, what are called the operational taxonomic units, and the phylogenetic analysis. Likewise, on the right-hand side, this is kind of more of a whole genome shotgun metagenomic sequencing. There's a fragmenting of the DNA, construction of paradin libraries, sequencing of heterogeneous mixture of the DNA, and then subjecting this all to a bioinformatics analysis, we can kind of, uh, get a functional um, alignment of um, the read. You can ident and what's most important is that we can identify enriched metabolic pathways and gene functions. And this is crucial for this whole new area of comparative metagenomics. That's just opening up all kinds of exciting new things uh, for us. So kind of some of the key findings are, well, one is that actually there's a relative abundance of metabolic and functional pathways that are more stable than the organismal abundance. And that's this idea about pinch hitting, is that maybe the species aren't so much uh, important as the function. And that's why these kind of the comparative metagenomics are really exciting at this time. Now, 
Um, just as further background before I actually get into the kind of meat of the, the talk is that you know there's a variety of phylum and there's uh, and uh, genus uh, that we're going to hear a lot about. Um, and rather than go through all these things, it just kind of uh, represents that um, you know Bifidobacterium and Lactobacilli are commonly uh, referred to. But in fact, that there are many other uh, representative genera that um, actually will turn out to be of clinically uh, very interesting importance, and not a pathogenic uh, sense necessarily. Now, a nice descriptive article about this um, about the human microbiome is available: um, the Annual Review of Genomics and Human Genetics. Um, Grice and, and Segre, and I highly recommend uh, this. Um, and, and we'll be making reference to a number of articles in the talk today. Um, the slides are going to be available uh, on the SIO website, so um, so if I go too quickly, uh, no worries. Uh, you'll be able to get them afterwards. But kind of key points three points that are, are the foundation for moving forward is one is that we have co-evolved and share a symbiotic relationship with our bacteria. And symbiotic is that is a cross-species um, uh, supportive relationship. You know, it's kind of, if our bacteria are happy, we're happy. If our bacteria are unhappy, we're unhappy. That is, it's kind of it's a back scratching, so to speak, relationship between us and our bacteria. Our bacteria do a great deal of work for us in terms of digesting food, producing vitamins, um, uh, warding off um, uh, pathogens, um, producing anti-pain medication, uh, pain compounds, produces a number of vitamins for us. Um, uh, list goes on and on. But surprising things that even our bacteria even feed us, and that is the enterocytes lining the intestine are actually fed by our bacteria. That is, if we have a good uh, bacterial ecology. And I think that this is kind of a, a point that I've been making in a lot of public talks, is that our gut is not a gutter. It's actually much more of a garden. And our mission is to be good gardeners. And uh, from a more biological perspective is that this is not just a sewage system. It actually is a biologically very active, um, interactive um, site. And we'll discuss that in just a little bit. And that is, and this activity includes that, that microbial signaling affects us as we are not independent. It affects our metabolic, neurologic, inflammatory, immu immune systems, and host defense functions. In fact, our bacteria are clearly linked to our mood, our energy, our metabolism. It's kind of we truly are actually a product, uh, some sort of our bacteria. And our hope is is that by optimizing our bacteria, that will be also be a way of optimizing our health. Now, the other thing is that any of the five forms of stress that we humans can experience environmental, physical, emotional, pharmaceutical, dietary can shape the microbiome population and the secondary metabolism of that and even affect uh, kind of our gut function. Now, when, when this is a, a huge topic and just even yesterday's National Academy of Sciences um, uh, conference on the microbiome, it was over eight hours just focusing on relationship to the microbiome, pretty much in obesity and insulin resistance um, issues. And they still didn't cover this in, uh, in great enough depth. The field is just growing. But for oncology, here are some areas that I think we all uh, should be interested in. One is just the direct effects. And we have things like H. pylori and uh, gastric lymphoma and gastric cancer, as well as H. pylori is reducing the risk for gastroesophageal uh, cancer. Um, we have the issues of hyperinsulinism, obesity, and uh, the low-grade inflammation via what we call the metabolic endotoxemia um, that can drive uh, these. The whole 
uh, problems with estrogen metabolism. And we'll cover this in more detail um, a bit. Um, cancer cell proliferation um, in the situation of low small chain fatty acids uh, in our gut, which are a product, again, of our microbiome and our diet. Uh, the relationship to anxiety, depression, and gastrointestinal distress, immune function, there's certainly risk for C. diff. Um, and then the whole idea about intestinal wall integrity and bacterial translocation for things such as neutropenic fever, and sepsis, and the like. Now, I want to be focusing um, uh, a bit on uh, direct effects, particularly in colorectal cancer. Um, we'll address um, issues related to obesity, which is just kind of fascinating um, area, um, I wish I could spend more time on it, um, I'll take questions about that. And then issues about uh, estrogen-related uh, um, uh, cancers um, and the relationship to gut function. We won't be able to have time for small chain fatty acids or other things, but uh, I look forward to there being more conversation around this at the national conference. Um, so uh, the first area I really want to uh, talk about is really actually going and taking a look at gut function itself. And this is kind of a transitional slide here as we kind of uh, shift to kind of a more of a, um, a discussion of a schematic representation of crosstalk between bacteria and intestinal mucosa. And so here we have a, uh, probably a fairly complex uh, slide, but let's take it uh, kind of area by area, and you'll see that it kind of makes good sense. We'll start here in the upper left-hand corner about maintenance of permeability. You know, at the intestinal epithelial level, um, probiotic or, or friendly or beneficial bacteria can allow effects through uh, transient colonization and or release of bioactive compounds. Um, this translates into reinforcement of the intestinal barrier, which, as you call, is just one cell thick, uh, as well as direct modulation of epithelial cell functions, including cytokine and chemokine release. And translocation of bacteria to the lamina propria uh, can affect innate and adaptive immunity by activating production of cytokines by monocytes and macrophages. Now, sampling of the intestinal contents by M cells in Peyer's patches and the subsequent engulfment by dendritic cells um, of the innate immune system can contribute to um, present microbial can contribute to presenting microbial antigens to naive T cells in the Peyer's patches and mesenteric lymph nodes, and that's in this area here. If you can see my slides, and so this all allows the immunoglobulin A um, and kind of antibody mediated um, mucosal response take place against intestinal bacteria uh, to prevent overgrowth and spreading beyond uh, the mesenteric lymph nodes. But this also can be an antigen coded for recombinant probiotic strains that we use as vaccines. And so if the same processing pathways play a critical role in the shaping of mucosal immunity uh, towards a non-inflammatory uh, tolerogenic uh, pattern and that takes place through induction of regulatory T cells. And so um, but there's a lot of conversation. It's not just the gutter. There's a lot of um, bidirectional communication and, and um, modulation of activity. Now, if we apply this idea to um, the series of mutational events that take place for the creation of a colorectal cancer, um, here is what we know. We know that um, loss of function of the APC gene, the adenomatous polyposis coli gene. Um, this is a protein involved, uh, it encodes a protein involved in cell adhesion and transcription. And this is found up to 80, found up in, in up to 85% of uh, all cases of colorectal cancer. 
KRS here is a GTPase that controls cell proliferation. And that's mutated in about 50 to 60 percent of cases of colorectal cancer. And, um, um, and then um, the P53, um, uh, later, um, the mutations here, um, they tend to be late events, increase resistance of cancer cells to apoptosis. Now, the question is that since we've got you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 trillion bacteria there um, encountering our single enterocyte uh, layer, and that there's a lot of, of activity back and forth, there's a reasonable question, can certain bacteria promote cancer? And so I did about looking for kind of an alpha, uh, uh, kind of an alpha bacteria that would do that. In fact, that might exist. People looked for it, and uh, there, there are some, there are some uh, um, possibilities. But actually, there are many more things that we need to consider. Um, they include uh, secondary bile salt, um, uh, such as deoxycholic acid and lysicholic acid. Uh, includes the role of the beta-glucuronidases and the deconjugation or the reversing of hepatic detoxification pathways. There's th such things as production of hydrogen sulfide or the aglycones or aromatic amines um, or production of acid aldehyde or reactive oxygen species or desulfuration of bile acids. All of these have potential and there's very interesting literature on all of these. Um, the key point is that there are numerous toxic and genotoxic host metabolites um, that can lead to mutations by binding specific cell surface receptors and affecting intracellular signal transduction. And the literature on, on this is, is growing. And so, um, so actually, the intestinal ecology of which uh, the microbiome is playing a big role um, a fascinating growing literature in this area. Now, if we um, take a look at just kind of like looking for kind of an alpha bacteria, well, we can say that uh, um, Fusobacterium predominate more in, in, in a variety of, of, of studies, um, and that decreased numbers of other bacteria exist. And it's associated with decreased butyrate production. Now, butyrate is a, is what is produced by our bacteria that actually feed our enterocytes. We don't feed our own enterocytes. They are tended for and cared for by our own bacteria. If we have a good balance, then good butyrate production exists, um, and the enterocytes thrive. If there's decreased, de decreased production of butyrate, then that is a significant biological stress that single layer of enterocytes that separate us uh, from the 100 trillion bacteria in our gut. And so these type of stressors can affect uh, kind of um, translocation of bacteria and other things, and, and what might uh, some people have turned leaky gut. And, uh, but in fact, the actual um, uh, multiple activities can take place when decreased butyrate uh, production exists. Now, but I just want to uh, just kind of highlight one particular bacterial transformation which is present um, in the gut. And that is the 7-alpha dehydroxylation of cholic acid that is a, a, uh, from the gallbladder, from liver production, and chinodeoxycholic acid to produce the potential carcinogens, deoxycholic acid and lithocholic acid. And uh, there, these, this production is, is upregulated and downregulated in some sense um, or, um, by the presence or absence of certain bacteria in our gut. So, for example, uh, recently I saw a woman um, get uh, measured um, uh, for some pancreatic problems and measured a deoxycholic acid level in her stool and came back sky high. So I went, then went and took a look at the bacterial, uh, the kind of uh, a measure, a look at their microbiome, and found no E. coli. Zip. 
but incredibly heavy overgrowth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so, in fact, actually, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is one of the gram-negatives that actually can produce deoxycholic acid. And so um, the key point here is that these things actually are measurable and modifiable. And uh, in this particular case I mentioned about the high um, deoxycholic acid um, treatment with uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, prebiotics, and probiotics uh, led to complete resolution as well as resolution of her pancreatic uh, problems. Uh, and that's uh, in press right now. Um, but um, Bernstein, the, actually a husband-wife team, have actually done a great deal of research in this area. Um, re this is from a recent article in Archives of Toxicology. They're really talking about high bioacid levels, which they suggest come from a high-fat diet and the need for increased bioacids, but it may in fact actually come from the microbiome itself. The, um, the proposed pathway is that uh, um, cells undergo oxidative or nitrosative stress. Some of these are going to survive and with DNA damage. They're going to replicate. There's going to be an increase in, in mutant cells. Repeat exposure uh, is going to lead to those with a growth advantage. Natural selection is going to lead to a pre-malignant field of defective tissue for the mutation, and they have a cancer. And so, in fact, actually, they published uh, in 2013 an article about um, a deoxycholic acid as a, uh, a uh, carcinogen. Um, and uh, this will, um, is going to continue to be uh, to grow. Um, this is a very exciting new area. Now, if we're talking about just about colon rectal cancer, what what is some of the literature about where probiotics may offer benefit? Um, is kind of, and we've got a variety of things from this kind of reparative mechanisms, proliferation, apoptosis differentiation, and uh, very interesting is that actually his last uh, reference here about enhancement of um, uh, chemotherapy uh, with uh, uh, at least for 5-FU. I thought, well, isn't this interesting? It's kind of, OK, yes, for anyone getting a chemotherapeutic uh, uh, intervention, you know, how can we optimize uh, the best uh, response for that? And in fact, it may be taking a look at uh, the microbiome. So um, transition to new topic, and that is obesity. This has been a fascinating topic in, in newspapers, magazines, et cetera, around the world because of literature showing that, in fact, stool transplants between mice can make, without any change in diet, truly no change in diet, no change in exercise, massive change in weight, either up or down taking the poop out of a heavy mouth and giving it to a thin mouth. The thin mouth becomes thin. Take the, the poop from a thin mouth, put it into a heavy mouth. The heavy mouth becomes, or the thin mouth becomes heavy, heavy mouth becomes thin. It's kind of like, wow. And in fact, so the question then became, people who are obese, are they, is their microbiome different? And the answer is, Yes, remarkably so. And it's kind of at the phylum level, certainly a reduced bacterial diversity, and um, altered representation of key genes and metabolic pathways. So um, just to show that exchanging the microbiome does uh, ref uh, change uh, the phylogenetic uh, appearance, um, here are three articles um, that involved on uh, transplantation um, between fat and thin mice. Um, and so um, maybe in our lifetime we will see uh, this actually applied uh, to people for treating obesity rather than gastric bypass. Um, as I mentioned, yesterday's National Academy of Science or New York Academy of Sciences conference spent eight or nine hours uh, on this topic. And it was just, I just, uh, 
can only scratch the surface right here. Is I wanted to show you just kind of where kind of things are, are going. And that is a lot of people are doing heat maps. And we kind of cross-referencing by different bacteria and then by different um, um, uh, uh, correlations. Um, and so you can kind of take a, a look at, at uh, key relationships. Now, this is far too much detail to take in. Uh, this is just, this is a, um, a, um, a study um, uh, where there were obese women um, were given a high prebiotic diet. Um, and just to kind of show, one of the, the changes uh, is in a bacteria that most of us have never heard of, I'm sure, that Calancella aerophasians and um, and then hiperate or hyperic acid. Um, so what we can say is, uh, just as an example of where the research is going in this area, uh, that coenstella was significantly augmented with the prebiotics. And we'll cover prebiotics in a little bit later. But the effect is, with a dietary intervention, we could significantly change the microbiome. This is, and this is reasonable because coenstella has been associated with a low risk of colon cancer. Now, additionally, because we're more interested in not necessarily the bacteria itself, but what is the functional uh, value of things, and that is that this also correlated uh, quite strongly with higher levels of hyperate, um, which is a gut-derived metabolite commonly associated with a healthy phenotype. And for example, this is a discriminant metabolite uh, between a lean and obese or diabetic individual uh, based on um, you know, whether low or high levels of hyperate. And so the, the key point here is that actually um, is that with this prebiotic intervention in obese women, uh, we could uh, document um, some measures, some biomarkers that um, that aren't uh, full um, outcomes, but are just suggest that that there is some positive uh, benefit. Um, all right, moving to kind of the uh, the last topic um, here, and that is the second bacterial transformation I want to talk about, and that is the bacterial beta glucuronidases. And bacterial beta glucuronidase. Um, can deconjugate what the liver has conjugated and excreted into the bile. And so and this is kind of a, a, a key point. In order to get rid of uh, estrogens, other hormones alike, um, and for actually many uh, things, the second phase of detoxification in the liver involves uh, deconjugation. And then these uh, are excreted um, into the bile, and they can pass uh, out of the body. However, if we have an overgrowth of species um, or strains that produce a lot of beta-glucuronidase, the challenge is that you can actually just reverse that whole process and actually then send it right back to the body, right back to where it is coming from. And, uh, and this is definitely a concern key point here is that this also is measurable and modifiable. So let me share with you this uh, um, uh, slide showing about where um, this is of significance to anyone with a estrogen-related cancer. And that is, we start in the upper left-hand corner again, where we've got kind of a circulating estrogen pool in the bloodstream, goes to the liver, um, is deconjugated, or is conjugated, is sent to the bile. These conjugated estrogens enter into the intestinal lumen where the what's called the estrobolome um, um, exists, and that is where estrogens can uh, be addressed. These can be addressed by um, environmental modulators, again, which will affect beta-glucuronidase-producing bacteria, or kind of the home uh, uh, kind of base uh, gene uh, function. The key point here 
is that what the liver has done to conjugate and excrete this in the estrobolome can deconjugate as these estrogens in the intestinal tract and then key point reabsorption send them right back via enterohepatic circulation right back to the liver so all you were thinking that while wow, we're trying to actually decrease uh, estrogen uh, overexposure uh, while wow, this is a key issue could this also be a factor in a woman's lifetime exposure to estrogens as well and it certainly seems to make sense now I want to take you through a very important slide here, um, starting again with the left-hand corner. Key circulating um, estrogens are estrone, E1, and, and estradiol, um, E2. Uh, estrone, E1, comes via aromatase from DHEA. Um, estradiol comes uh, via aromatase from testosterone. And they're interconvertible by the 17 beta HSD uh, enzyme, but they share a variety. Uh, they share um, key things, and a lot of significant metabolism comes from estrone or um, E1. Estrone can it goes it can be metabolized into three different compounds of, of biological significance uh, for our concern tonight. One is a 2-hydroxy. Two is the 4-hydroxy, and three is the 16-alpha hydroxy. Now, the both the 2-hydroxy and the 4-hydroxy go through a variety of things, which will um, um, go through actually go through, have a, a bifurcation. If methylation capacities are good, and the, and the COMT polymorphisms are appropriate, and then uh, the methylation and onto actually um, uh, safe uh, estrogens uh, for processing. However, in the case uh, that, uh, that methylation isn't uh, uh, sufficient, they can actually go uh, and form what are called uh, semiquinones, and that's kind of the middle uh, compounds here, which can then be oxidized into um, quinones. And of these, the 3,4 quinone from the 4-hydroxy, this is at great risk if, if we are, for example, low in glutathione, uh, say via Tylenol or other compounds, then we can't get the glutathione conjugate. We produce depurinating adducts. So, a couple uh, key things here. One is methylation by COMT. So actually, methylation is an important uh, concept. Oxidation is an important concept. And glutathione uh, conjugation is an important uh, concept. But um, with suboptimal areas, we soon are going to produce depurinating adducts. And these are uh, quite concerning. Let me explain why. And I'll try to explain this. Um, so when we talk about the 3,4 quinones from the 4-hydroxy metabolite of estrone E1 can react with DNA to form depurinating adducts. And these are about 99% of all um, DNA adducts uh, formed um, from estrogens. Um, these adducts are released from DNA to generate apurinic sites, and therefore, um, if we, therefore we need the base excision repair, which of course can be error prone, and therefore lead to mutations that can initiate breast, prostate, and other types of cancer. Now, why I thought it was very interesting is that in all estrogen-related cancers, these particular 3,4 quinone uh, depurinating adducts are all measurable. They are also measurable in men with prostate cancer and in men with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
So if we think about estrogen metabolism in cancer in the microbiome, is kind of the key point is that depurinating addicts of estrogens are tumor initiators. That this enterohepatic recirculation of estrogens increases levels of these depurinating adducts. And that increased intestinal bacterial beta-glucuronidase results in greater reabsorption and enterohepatic recirculation of unconjugated free estrogens. And so, in fact, our microbiome actually is related to estrogenic or estrogen-related uh, cancers. So, can we uh, restore and maintain a healthy uh, estrobilome? Well, right now I can tell you we can measure beta-glucuronidase activity. Uh, I do so frequently in my uh, clinic. We can measure estrone metabolites. Uh, can do this, again, from blood or from urine. And uh, we can modify um, the functional activity estrobilome. And why is this of interest to us? Well, of any estrogen-driven malignancy risk, so endometrial cancer, breast cancer, some ovarian cancers, um, and it's a very interesting relationship with um, men with prostate cancer, men with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I, I, maybe someone can teach me about how that, how these are relate. But certainly, also for women, we can look at um, estrogen-driven malignancy risk identification, um, and maybe we don't need to go to bilateral mastectomies if we have other means of modifying uh, uh, gene function expression. And uh, third issue is that we certainly can rebalance uh, the microbiome uh, with beta-glucuronidase and beta-glucuronide activities. And I think that in this rebalancing uh, is going to be uh, of uh, greater interest in oncology uh, in the near future. So, uh, so wrapping up, um, last section here, um, I want um, return to our original question. Should we ever prescribe bacteria? And you're going to say, well, there are no randomized controlled trials. It's not, um, it's not an up-to-date. No, I don't think we should. And I think that's actually, and that's very reasonable. I, well, my point is that, boy, we certainly have a lot of research ahead of us that needs to be done. And key challenges we all need to be aware of is that this idea of being locked into a pharmaceutical approach, and that is kind of like one single strain, high dose uh, measure uh, changes, as opposed to a multiple species and opposed to uh, what is the overall ecology. Uh, we're talking about 500 species in the gut. Uh, how are they all interacting? And uh, we're really talking about a, a, a kind of an ecology that is as, as or more complex than the Amazon or a, any um, coral reef. And then free intervention. What about what is the physiological state of the cultures at the time of production? Of, um, how, how old are the cultures? You know, kind of what kind of die-off over time do they have? Um, how do you dose in terms of colony-forming units uh, and of which uh, species? How much? These are all fundamental fundamental questions. Um, but likewise, the additional question we need to consider is. What about giving one size fits all? Does that make sense? Or should we look to have a microbiome profile identifying deficiencies and designing intervention to address uh, replenishment or rebalancing of deficiency and excess? And I think that still needs to be worked out. Certainly, I want to kind of emphasize the very interesting research opportunities since we can measure beta-glucuronidase and estrogen metabolism. We can measure secondary bioacids and uh, multiple biomarkers related to GI cancers. Um, we can measure small chain fatty acid production um, and the like. And um, um, as that's kind of moving forward to interventions, we also really need to understand about the microbiome's resilience to perturbations, uh, and particularly in oncology, what does what does putting someone on a high fructose corn syrup diet of um, Ensure do? 
um, or someone who is um, who is not eating, what does that do? What about all the antibiotics or the PPIs or surgery or radiation and chemotherapy? We really don't know about perturbations, and we really don't know how best uh, to rebalance them. Uh, fascinating opportunities in our lifetime. So let me, um, and the, so for our third question uh, tonight, if we can do this really quickly, Holly, um, and that is, the question is, um, how many of you are currently recommending a prebiotic diet to your patients? The question for everyone is, how many of you, or are you, excuse me, are you currently recommending a prebiotic diet to your patients? Laura has launched our poll. Okay. And we're going to give it just a moment. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, we should have our results just in just a moment. And it appears our results are 40% yes and 60% no. Okay. All right. So, again, um, can you see my screen now? We can see the question mark. If you click on your screen, it will begin to move your, move your, uh, your slides again for you, doctor. Okay. All right. All right. So prebiotics are really the topic I want Doctor, to include. Uh, Doctor uh, Plotnikoff, we still have your question mark on the screen. Okay. Can you there see this now? There we go. Okay. We can. All right. So the idea about prebiotics, and these are non-digestible food ingredients, beneficially affect hosts, selectively stimulating the growth and or activity of one or more um, bacteria in the intestines and thus improve host. Um, and these are not uh, addressed in the upper GI, but predominantly, uh, but in the colon itself. Um, this, um, um, a lot of people think, well, is it fiber or prebiotics? Uh, no, actually, not all fiber is a prebiotic. Um, things which are prebiotics are, be known as inulin, uh, fructooligosaccharides, um, galactooligosaccharides, soya, xylo, pyrodextrins. Um, these are all um, prebiotics. Um, and um, certainly many of these are fibers. Um, most are fibers. Uh, and I believe inulin would be considered a, a fiber per se. But most Americans only get about 15 grams of fiber today. And with the top two sources of fiber being potatoes, mostly French fries, and white bread. And um, so we do have lots of room to move in improving the health of, um, of uh, or the diet uh, of our population. It has been shown by our recent uh, work, uh, archaeologists, that our ancestors, um, distant ancestors, probably had a diet of about 100 grams of fiber per day. Now, Dr. Potnikoff, I just wanted to let you know that we are at about 8.55. We did have a okay. few moments of technical difficulty, so okay. I think we're going to go on a, a few extra minutes, but I wanted to give you okay. a time check. All right. Cool. All right. We're just about done here. Okay. So here's a list of prebiotic foods, um, a number of things from um, you know, chicory and jicama and leek and onions, wheat and rye. Fermented vegetables, it can be anything from sauerkraut and kimchi. Uh, there's a variety uh, uh, in every culture of the world. We find fermented dairy and things like uh, kefir. Um, um, certainly cultured dairy also, uh, in some sense, can be considered a prebiotic, uh, supporting uh, growth of lactobacilli, that's lactic acid-producing bacteria. And certainly fibrous foods or fibrous supplements. Um, the key point here is that is that actually focusing on diet um, and dietary intake of diverse plant fibers does promote microbiome diversification, does improve gene richness, and does improve risk phenotypes. 
And this point about diet is really takes us right back to to year 1908, Eli Metchnikoff. The dependence of the intestinal microbes on food makes it possible to adapt measures to modify the flora in our bodies and to replace harmful microbes by mucil microbes. Wow, and it takes a, a, a hundred years or more for good ideas to come around. Anyway, thank you so much for your participation. I hope that we have some questions, um, and um, and I feel free uh, to email me as a fellow SIO member if I can be helpful in any way. I'm at Gregory dot at Alina dot com. That's A L L I N A dot com. And thank you very much, and, um, uh, Laura. Well, Holly, do we at have this time, let's let's open this open it up for questions. If you have questions for Dr. Plotnikoff, please type them into the question box at the bottom of your uh, go to webinar screen on the right side of your your screen. And we'll wait for a few moments to see if anybody has any questions. So I'm just uh, kind of pondering. It's kind of it sounds like a lot of people are personally doing um, prebiotics uh, or probiotics, and a lot of people are aware of kind of prebiotics. And I bet a lot of people are recommending a prebiotic diet without even recognizing it. And diet, Dr. Uh, Plotnikoff, we do yeah. have a question. Uh, okay. The uh, from Lynn Cutler, the genotype that is improved, is that for all genes or for the microbiome? Uh, the, the genotype that is an, um, improved. Um, the, um, what we're talking about is kind of the genotype of the microbiome is, is adjustable by uh, adjusting kind of relative percentages of species and the, and the like, and I think that's what uh, what you're referring to. But likewise, it's kind of you know we're stuck with the 23,000 genes or so that we have. The, uh, what people have been pointing out is just even if we, uh, just like um, twins do not have identical health histories, and that is that we have multiple modifiers, positive and negative, of our gene function, and that we should be aware of these. Um, they include everything from um, things such as uh, uh, vitamin D, uh, as well as to other hormones, um, as well as we should be uh, recognizing that um, that the microbiome can also uh, does have a lot of uh, uh, activity and that we we'll interact with. Um, Lynn is DNA. interjecting. Uh, Lynn is yep. interjecting that she was referring to the prebiotics, and you wrote that it, Im it improves genes phenotype. It improves the, the risk phenotype, yes. Okay. Is that the, okay, yeah, it improves gene richness. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I do uh, have so another that is question. The, that is the, yes. Oh, go ahead, please. I don't want to interrupt. Yes, do you, can you see my screen? Um, I, I, we changed presenters, but I can certainly move it to you, and your screen should be live now, doctor. Okay. Let me just check it. Okay. All right. So on air showing screen. Okay. I hope that. Yes. Hope, hope that's that's yep. helpful. Gene richness and risk phenotype are can be addressed. Okay. And we do have another question um, from Claudette Baker, who would like to know how can we determine which probiotics are appropriate for a patient? Great question. And um, a couple, a couple things. I'm someone who likes measurement, and uh, and so I'm, I do uh, a lot of specialized stool testing. But I also have a very much a, a referral population of uh, physician referrals of really complex patients, and so I feel I can get away with that. Without doing specialized testing, I, there are a couple things that uh, I think about with probiotics. Number one, I tell everyone. Uh, go for at least 20 billion colony forming units per day of multiple strains of both lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. And if possible, the friendly uh, yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii. Take this with cool, unchlorinated water. Your city tap water is full of chlorine to get rid of bacteria. 
and take this at least 30 minutes away from warm food or drink. Uh, and these bacteria tend to be very heat sensitive. And so like having a probiotic and then having a morning cup of tea or a bowl of oatmeal makes for really expensive oatmeal. And um, so those are kind of uh, uh, key uh, topics. Some people are, are, are going to be sensitive to dosing. So for example, recently there have been a number of products out on Probiotic 225, VSL number 3, others which have hundreds of billions of colony forming units. And peop some people will have some gut reactions to that. At lower doses, uh, say 10 to 20 billion colony forming units, people can still have a reactivity. And that may be because of something to do with certain species or certain overgrowth that they already have. Um, and so um, moving to a single species probiotic can be helpful and say like uh, uh, there's a variety of some that are kind of just one billion colony forming units of just one species and moving from that. A number of probiotics do contain FOS, uh, inulin, GOS, and other prebiotics with them. But for people with irritable bowel who have sensitivity to what are called the FODMAPs, that can create gut distress. And so when you have to be aware of, um, of, um, of what we call FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P, which is um, about the non-digestible short-chain carbohydrates that uh, can drive symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and then in cases of, of yeast overgrowth, um, there's a, a variety of thoughts about um, actually creating uh, problems if you use Saccharomyces boulardii. And so, um, uh, so that what one can learn over time from experience is just, um, um, is just uh, that um, you, can, you can customize based on response. And this is, I, I realize that this is more like a approach that might be used by the psychiatrist. Well, that antidepressant didn't work, so let's try this one. Um, and that's why I personally like uh, kind of measurement. And there are a variety of national labs which provide this kind of uh, these measures um, at a fairly uh, reasonable uh, price uh, for the patient. And uh, talk about those. Uh, I didn't. I'm not a representative of any of these labs, and uh, um, and so I, I don't want to mention any commercial products or purposes in this talk. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. I'm just going to give one more moment for uh, um, another question, but it looks as if that is uh, the end of our questions. So I will Great. begin okay, to wrap, well, thi wrap things yeah. up here. I do have a comment from Claudette. She says, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Cool. So I will now begin to wrap things up, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate all your right. presentation. Well, thank you. We'll see you um, all uh, in Vancouver. All right, if I can keep everyone's attention for just one more moment. Our next webinar is scheduled to be held on Monday, July 29th at 1 p.m. when our topic will be something new under the sun, vitamin D and breast cancer prevention. Our presenter will be Catherine Crew, MD, MS. Dr. Crew is an assistant professor of medicine and epidemiology at the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center, and Dr. Crew cares for patients with breast cancer and women at high risk for breast cancer. We thank you again for your participation in this installment of our Society for Integrative Oncology Members Only webinar series. Early next week, a recording of this webinar and a PDF file of the presentation slides that Dr. Plotnikoff showed will become available on the members only section of the Society for Integrative Oncology webinar, or website. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Plotnikoff. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. And all. this concludes. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes today's presentation. Thank you all for joining us.